Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and open them with me to the book of Numbers. We're in Numbers chapter 23. We're right in the middle of Balak, uh, king of Midian, and uh, or king of Moab, excuse me. We'll see the connection there a little later. Um, coming and getting a prophet, a prophet of God, yet not a prophet connected with Israel. Um, we stated yesterday along the same lines as um, Melchizedek or um, uh, Jethro. So Balak wants Balaam to come and curse Israel. And he wants to pay him money in order to do this. Um, and we're in the process of that happening. Uh, God has made it very clear back in chapter 22. Look with me at verse 12. God says to Balaam, do not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. Well, Balaam loves money as we have already looked at yesterday. And so the money is what's his focus. And God says no, and then like a little child, he's trying to bug him to death so that God will change his mind. And even when God does tell him to go, it's not as if God has changed his mind. We're going to say that clearly today. God never changed his mind. God is saying, oh, this is what you want to do? Go do it and see what happens. We went through the whole donkey uh, episode yesterday. It's terrible that the, the donkey being known as the most stubborn animal of all of uh, the animal world is smarter than this prophet of God that is less stiff-necked than Balaam. Now we get to chapter 23. Chapter 23 and chapter 24 go together. So today is going to be a, an odd break because there are four prophecies uh, in these two chapters that go together, all of which are Balaam trying to get God or trying to manipulate God to change his tune. Remember, God is not going to be manipulated. His plan will not be thwarted, as Job so succinctly said. What God promised in Genesis chapter 12 will come to pass. Let's go back there, all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. The flood has just been done. Uh, God has uh, confounded the languages in Babel. We come to chapter 12 and God is calling a man by the name of Abram. He will change his name to Abraham, who is the father of the Jewish people. It says this in verse one, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house to a land which I will show you. The very land, by the way, that Israel is going into right now that the king of Moab doesn't want, want them to go into. Then there's some I wills here. I will make you a great nation. God's already said that. I will bless you and make your name great. So you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. Remember that. And in all the families of the earth, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, we know that all of this is focused on the coming of Messiah. But here, he's made a promise to Abraham that your descendants in the country, the nation that comes forth from you, the, the, will be separate from the rest of the world. And the people who accept them and bless them, God is going to bless. I think our nation uh, is, is evidence of that. It's being tested right now, however, and we will eventually fail the test. Uh, I'm going to curse those who are going to curse you. And it's interesting 
that in this chapter and next chapter, we're going to see Balaam wanting with, in the worst way to curse Israel so he can get money. Uh, yet God will not allow him. Yet God knows his heart and God knows that he wants to curse Israel. God knows that he ultimately finds a way. And we'll talk about that a little more today. When we get to chapter 25 of Numbers, we'll see the outcome of that. But God curses Balak and God curses Balaam. And we're going to see that happen as the, the text works out. Um, all because what God has promised to Abram will happen and it has happened so uh god has already made his will clear to balaam balaam does not want to hear it because he wants money he loves money more than he loves god and, and we've been trying to examine that in our own lives because this is a tendency that all of us have because money helps our lust of the flesh, our lust of the eyes and our boastful pride of life. What the Bible speaks of as our old sinful nature. And so be reminded uh, and live our lives not for and not focused on fulfilling these. If you haven't already read chapter 23, read it. And we're gonna pray and uh, and we'll look into it. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. It is truth. It doesn't matter how I or anyone else feels about your word. Your word is truth and you will not be manipulated. So Father, may we not try to get our words in your mouth, but may we digest your word and may it come out of our mouths. Help us in this endeavor that we might bring glory to you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Chapter 23, Balaam says to Balak, build seven altars to me here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. Now, just remember what we went through in the last chapter. Balaam has known right from the beginning, even before, remember, God is the one that initiates true prophecy, not the prophet. So Balaam is trying to go through this great struggle and he puts on this great display. Now, if you read commentaries, they'll give, they have all kinds of opinions on why there's seven altars. Um, no one knows. It just seems to be, to me, that Balaam wants to make a big outward display of coming before God. Maybe we could call it peacocking. He's peacocking in front of them, but he already knows what God has said, and God's not going to change his tune. But see, when God's will uh, is, in, is, is contrary to my will, they're going to collide. And let me tell you, God's will is not going to be the loser. Balaam is going to be the loser. These are good things for all of us to learn as we walk through life. Balak did just as Balaam said and, and had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, stand beside your burnt offering. And I will go, perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. Again, he already knows what God has said. Um, it, it's kind of like people saying, well, you know, God hasn't called me to missions work or, you know, again, you don't need a calling from God when we have a commission from God. We already know what God's will is for every believer. It's go make disciples. Oh, well, let's see if God... No. The question then gets really narrow when we know what God's will is. Am I willing to submit to it or am I going to rebel against it? You see, Balaam wants the money and he can't get the money because he goes against God's will. But we're going to see that he finds a way to get the money. 
Uh, so he went to a bare hill. Now God met Balaam and said to him. Now, this is Balaam saying to God. Interesting. Balaam says to God, I have set up seven altars and have offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. As if, well, God, I did all this, so now give me what I want. Trying to manipulate God. Then this interesting phrase is used twice in this chapter here in verse 5 and again in verse 16, where it says, then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. So what's interesting is, Verses 7 through 10 and verses 18 through 24 are in the original Hebrew language poetic and therefore this is poetic verse directly from the mouth of God. God tells him, return to Balak and you shall speak thus. So he returned and he, he said, from Aram, Balak has brought me, Moab's king from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me. Come, denounce Israel. Then he says, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? As I see him from the top of the rocks, and I took him at, and I, and I look at him from the hills, behold, a people who dwells apart and will not be reckoned among the nation. Now let's take that, that verse. I think it's interesting that here we see this is a word from God, but here, even in the middle of him speaking the word of God, he's talking saying, well, from my perspective, uh, as I see him, uh, you, you hear people say this a lot. Well, you know, my interpretation um, usually this is just a smoke screen to know what God's word says, do the opposite and somehow feel like we're being obedient to God. Um, the Bible for the most part is very easy to understand. Um, if we would take the time to really get into the words. Now, Aram uh, is where Balaam was from, which is modern day Syria. And uh, he sees him from the top of the rocks. It says, uh, behold, a people who dwells apart or separate. Um, we use this word set apart or holiness or even the word sanctification. Um, Israel was set apart from every other nation in the world. We see later uh, when Jesus comes on the scene uh, that, again, it's Jews and Gentiles. The, the Israel is set apart from the whole world. Even today, some 3,000 years later, still we see uh, Israel is set apart. A couple things. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 26. Uh, some wisdom here. Uh, Proverbs 26. Verse two, it says, like a sparrow in its flitting, like a sparrow in its flying, so a curse without cause does not alight. Okay, so just speaking a curse is not going to hurt Israel. God, we've already talked about that yesterday. God is protecting them. Now, uh, behold, it says, look, this is a, a holy people. Does that mean that these people are perfect? Well, clearly, but we have seen all the way through Exodus and Numbers that this people, Israel, is not a perfect people. However, they are God's people. And that means they are children of God while not being perfect. They are God's responsibility, not anyone else's responsibility. And it, as children, God is a disciplining father. He is not permissive. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, 
Look with me at verse 5. It says this. Um, Have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So don't get the wrong idea is what I'm trying to get. Israel, when they disobey God, God deals with them. But nobody else better mess with them. Look at verse 10, back in Numbers 23. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the, the fourth part of Israel? Uh, they're so large, <laughs> I can't even count 25% of them. Then he says this, let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. He's saying, hey, okay, uh, the idea is that if I am righteous before God, I will die a happy death. That's, that's the thought. And Balaam, at the end of his uh, saying, says, hey, I would like to die the death of Israel because they're righteous, so they're going to have a, a good end, a good death. The only problem is that Balaam is not right with God. He is a wicked prophet, and he's proving that because he knows God's will, yet he's trying to manipulate for the opposite um, will he die a good death? Well, uh, no. You can go to Joshua 13, 22 and find out that Israel kills him. God deals with Balaam. God also deals with Balak. And we're going to see that as we move forward in the text. Um, verse 11, then Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I, I, I took you to curse my enemies, but behold, you actually blessed them. I'm paying you good money. What are you doing? I'm paying you to curse them, and now you've blessed them. Balaam replied, Must I not be careful to speak what the Lord put in my mouth? He's still being disingenuous. Well, the Lord, I, I, mean, I mean, if he comes to the Lord 17 times, he's going to get the same answer. Then Balak said to him, please come with me to another place. Maybe it's just the place. And this, this so reminds me of back in Genesis chapter 28. Uh, Esau and Jacob get into their, uh, their fight over Jacob deceiving and getting the, the, the blessing from Isaac, his father. And he's leaving to go to um, his uncle Laban's house. And he comes and to Bethel, and God meets him there. And let's read it in Genesis 28. In Genesis 28, um, it says this in verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. You know, he was... He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than Bethel, uh, the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. <laughs> he misunderstands God. He, God is omnipresent, meaning everywhere is God's place. God is everywhere at the same time. He's not confined by time, by space, or by matter. But now Jacob doesn't, this is the first contact that he has with Yahweh. And so he thinks that he has just kind of haphazardly stumbled upon God and that this is the porthole to God and he just kind of came across it. No, God is initiating with him directly. But he doesn't see it that way yet. That's why later on he will wrestle with God. Balaam has this very much misunderstanding of God and so does Balak. They think, oh, the problem is we're over here to the north. If we go to the south a little bit, then maybe that's what God wants. No, God wants you to bless Israel, not curse them. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you're on the north side of town or the east side of town. But they don't get that. 
So they go to Pisgah and verse 15. Balaam says to Balak again, stand here beside your offerings while I myself meet the Lord over there. Then the Lord met Balaam and put the word, a word in his mouth. He said, go to him and speak. Um, Balak says, what's the Lord said? And then this word from God. Arise, O Balak, verse 18, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man. Okay, very, this is helping giving us a little picture window into the character of God. And remember, this is ultimately what we're trying to discern first and foremost from every text. What is this telling me about the, the character of God? Because God's character never changes. His nature never changes. Hebrews 13, 8 says he's the same yesterday, today, forever. So man, according to Romans 1, loves to make God into his own image. But here God's saying, look, man is made in the image of God, but God is not like a man that he should lie. Nor is he like a son of man that he should even turn or change course. Repent means 180 degree turn, going this way, going this way. So what he's saying, God's not, a, he isn't change his mind like, uh, okay, I told you to bless Israel and now 180 degrees difference, I want you to go curse Israel. No. He says, has he said, if he said something, he's going to do it. Has he said and will not do it? Or has he spoken and will not make it good? The answer to that is clearly no. Behold, I have received a command to bless. When he has blessed, then I cannot revoke it. He has observed, he has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord is God, the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Very important verse. Uh, this word from God, I believe, starts to stem a thought, a wicked thought in Balaam, a wicked thought that he could be a stumbling, like he could get his money. He finds a way to get his money. God's saying, there is no misfortune. Now that is translated in other ways, perverseness. There is no sin. There is no immorality. There is no idolatry in Israel at this moment. Not yet. But that gives Balaam a thought. Well, if God's saying there's no perverseness in them, well, that's why he's blessing them. Well, if he could get a something perverse going on in Israel, then God would curse them. Oh, what a wicked, insidious thought. Verse 22, it says, God brings them out of Egypt. He is for them like the horns of the wild ox. Now, this translation is interesting. In the King James, it is referred to, <laughs> I think it's translated unicorn. And some people have taken that as uh, something to poke fun at the Bible. That is a, a book of fairy tales. It even talks about unicorns. Um, the idea, this, this term translated means a strong horn, a strong single horn. Now that could be, uh, horn is, is thought of as strength. Um, the horn of my salvation, things like this is talked about. Or it could be talking about like a rhinoceros that is a very strong animal with one. Uh, when I say rhino, I mean the rhinoceros, not a uh, Republican in name only. <laughs> okay, so what he's saying is God brought them out of Egypt. What God starts, he's going to finish. Uh, verse 23, for there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. They're God's instruments and nothing that Balaam can do or Balak can do to stop that. The only one that can hurt Israel is Israel. And Balaam starts to understand that. So then he sets out to try to be a stumbling block to Israel. 
Now, we're going to see about that stumbling block in chapter 25. Now, you can go to Luke chapter 17, where Jesus speaks to being a stumbling block to um, little ones. He says, it'd be better that a millstone be hung around your neck and you be cast into the ocean than to be a stumbling block. Um, verse 24, it says, Behold, a people rises like a lioness, and as a lion it lifts itself. It will not lie down until it devours the prey. Now, interesting, uh, the lion and the lioness is describing Israel. The prey is describing Moab. So Balak couldn't be very happy about what he's hearing. And drink the blood of the slain. That He's talking about Balak's blood. So if you're paying a prophet to tell you what you want to hear, you're not getting it. And it goes on. Then Balak said to Balaam, do not curse them at all nor bless them. Would you just please shut up? I'd rather you didn't talk than to talk about my blood being spilt and lions eating me. Balaam replied to Balak, did I not tell you whatever the Lord speaks that I must do? Then Balak said to Balaam, please come. I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will be agreeable with God that you curse them for me from there. So they go to Peor and they start to do the same thing again. We'll see that in chapter uh, 24. So first prophecy, verses 1 through 12. Second prophecy, verses 13 through 26. Third prophecy, we're going to see in chapter 24 to verse 14. And then we'll actually see the fourth one uh, in tomorrow's text also. All of it trying to manipulate God. So as we come away from today, kind of in the middle of this, I hope you're seeing that when we pray, we should be asking God to reveal his will to us rather than telling God what is our will and hoping that he will conform to it. Rather than me telling God what I need, maybe I should be asking him what I need. Maybe instead of telling God to heal me, to fix me, to give me money, to, to help my job situation, maybe I should be seeking his will and his direction and how I can bring him glory and live in right relationship with him. And then from that, I can show the rest of the world what a love relationship with God looks like. Let's stop trying to manipulate each other and let's stop trying to manipulate God. Father, thank you for your word today. Help us to not sin in the way of Balaam. Father, free us from the love of money Free us from hating people and using them to gain wealth. Father, help us to use our temporary resources, the wealth that we have, to further your kingdom, to love you, and to help others know your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.